Hello and welcome to Bay College's online lectures for college algebra. I'm Jim Helmer and in this section 5.2 we're going to deal with the properties of rational functions. Let's just refresh our memory on rational numbers. A rational number is defined as an integer divided by another integer. Now it might be 1 half or it could be 5 sevenths, but it's just some expression involving a quotient. Now if we apply that to functions, we can have a polynomial divided by another polynomial, and we call this a rational function. Well, one thing we always have to keep in mind is we can never divide by 0, so our polynomial in our denominator cannot equal 0, and we're going to explore this in, in some detail here. If we look at this rational function, essentially what we have here is we have a polynomial 2x squared minus 4 divided by the polynomial x plus 5, this linear factor. Well, if we want to discover the domain of this, well, we essentially just have to say our denominator cannot equal 0. So my domain is x such that x cannot equal negative 5, because that would make this 0. So I have to exclude this from the domain. And I could write it in interval notation, just excluding negative 5, and have the union of two intervals. Let's look at this rational function here. Our polynomial on the top is a constant function. It's 1, right? And in the bottom, well, we have x squared minus 4. Well, the key to this is to factor it. We didn't have to factor this one. It was already a linear factor. But if we factor this, we get x plus 2, x minus 2. This is the difference of squares, so we can factor that. So our domain, we have to find the values of x to exclude because it makes it 0. x cannot equal, for this one it's negative 2, for this one it's positive 2, or plus or minus 2, however you want to look at it. So this would be our domain, any value that excludes negative 2 and 2. What about this one here? Well, the first thing to do is to find its domain. Well, its domain, we have this linear factor here x cannot equal a positive 1, because 1 minus 1 is 0, and we can't divide by 0. So we found the domain. Now, another thing that we can do to any rational number is reduce it. It's just a fraction. You're always told, reduce your fractions. Well, this one here, if I factor the top, I notice, well, this would factor to this, which isn't going to cancel anything. It's not going to reduce, so this is the reduced version of that. I can find the zeros. Now, to find the zeros of a rational function, we don't have to worry about the denominator, because this can never be 0, so we don't worry about that. We just look at the top. Well, if we look at the top, I factored it. If I set this equal to 0, I find that x cannot equal plus or minus the square root of 2. So my zeros are square root of 2, 0, and uh, negative square root of 2. 0, or just 2 plus or minus the square root of 2. That's my zeros. That's where it's going to uh, cross the x-axis or touch it. Well, in this case, it's just going to cross them in both cases. If we look at this one, if we go to find the zeros, we just have to find the uh, zeros of the top. Well, this is a constant function, so it has no zeros, so it has none. Now, this one. Now, watch what happens when we factor this. If we factor it, we get x plus or minus 1, because x squared minus 1 is the difference of square, so it does factor. Now, if we reduce this, x minus 1 cancels the factor of x minus 1. Our reduced function is now just x plus 1, this single factor. That even though if we look at this, the domain of this value is all real numbers, we still have to recall that the original function contained this q of x in the denominator, this polynomial. So this domain still remains. But if we go to find the 0, we say, well, x uh, would equal negative 1. That is my 0. So that's where it crosses the x-axis. All right. Now, it's important to keep this concept in mind uh, when we're looking at reducing these and finding their zeros and finding their domain. Find the domain first before you reduce it. But what you have to do with rational expressions is you do 
have to reduce them, just like you do rational functions. All right, let's look at the next concept here. The next thing we're going to do is look at limits. The limits of a function, for example, f of x equals 1 over x squared, when we talk about limits, essentially what we're looking for is the behavior of the graph as x goes one way or another. So the first thing we want to do with any rational function is determine its domain. If we look at this, well, I have an x in the denominator. This cannot equal 0. So my domain is x such that x is not equal to 0. And I've graphed it for you right here so you can see what it looks like. It has a piece of the graph over here and a piece of the graph over there. So it's not a polynomial, as we recall from the previous video, because it's not a continuous graph. There's two different pieces to it. And we can see its behavior as it approaches the y-axis. It goes up to infinity uh, from either side of this. And this is where we define a limit. We're asking, what is the behavior of the graph as x approaches the uh, y-axis? So if we look here, this is a little bit of new notation. It says x as x approaches 0 from the left. That's what that negative sign means. It's just telling us from what direction, from the left. To the left side of the axis, the y-axis, are our negative values. So we write this as the limit, lim, as x approaches 0 from the left. What is the behavior of the function? Well, if we look at this, as x approaches the y-axis from the left, the behavior of the function goes to infinity. That's where it's headed. What's its behavior? So we see that it goes to positive infinity. Well, what happens? What's the behavior as x approaches the y-axis, 0, from the right side, the positive side? Well, if we look at this, as we approach it, it goes to infinity as well. So the function's behavior, as x approaches that axis, it goes to infinity. Well, that means that our function never crosses the y-axis. And the y-axis is defined at x equals 0. Well, if it never crosses that, this x equals 0, that is defined as the vertical asymptote. Now, don't worry about this stuff right here. We'll actually return to that. But let's explore the vertical asymptote a little bit more. If we want to find the vertical asymptote of a function, if we're looking at some rational function, p of x over q of x, to find the zeros of q of x, that's our domain restrictions, we find those zeros and we exclude them from the domain, at which point we're going to reduce. Once we reduce, any remaining factors of q of x are the vertical asymptotes that value that the graph can never cross. Now, if once we reduce, if there are uh, factors that cancel, like in the last example we looked at, um, <clears throat> these are called holes. All right. So when we're dealing with holes, let's take a look at an example. What does this mean for finding vertical asymptotes? Well, the first thing I want to do is factor this. I want to find the zeros of q of x and exclude them from the domain. So this factors to x plus 1, x minus 1. Now, my domain, if I write it right here, is x cannot equal plus or minus 1. This is my domain restriction. Now, if I look at this, well, we have a factor that can cancel. So my new factor, or my new rational function, would be 1 over x minus 1. Now, the 0 find the zeros of q of x, and I found them plus or minus 1. One of them canceled. One of them remains. The remaining 0 for our q of x is my vertical asymptote. So it is the value x equals positive 1. My graph cannot cross this line, this vertical line, x equals 1. Well, what about the factor that canceled? Well, my graph cannot have this as an x value because it's not in the domain. That tells me I have what's called a hole at x equals negative 1. So if I were to graph this, I would want my graph to never cross x equals 1. But where the value of x equals negative 1, if I were to put that in here, 1 
over negative 2 at negative 1 half, I'm going to have a hole. So I'm going to have a hole at negative 1, negative 1 half. That's the point, negative 1, negative 1 half. I cannot go through this point. So I have a vertical asymptote and a hole. That's how we find vertical asymptotes. We essentially just find the zeros of q of x, then we reduce it. If any reduce, they are holes. If any remain, they are vertical asymptotes where our, gross, our graph cannot cross. Let's take a look at some functions. Let's look at this rational function here. If we break this down, we factor it, x plus 2, x minus 2, I know that x cannot equal plus or minus 2. Now, neither of these factors are going to cancel, so both of these are vertical asymptotes. I have vertical asymptotes at x equals plus or minus 2, two different lines. If we put this into a calculator, you'll see this graph. It's not a very nice graph. It's actually pretty complex. We have three different pieces to the graph. But we see our graph never crosses x equals negative 2, because that's one of my vertical asymptotes. And it never crosses x equals positive 2, my other vertical asymptote. So we would see that if we went ahead and graphed it. Now if we look at this function, well, if we look at this function, we see that, well, this doesn't factor, right? x squared plus 1, there are no real values that would make this 0. If I set it equal to 0, I get x equals plus or minus i. Well, that means there are no vertical asymptotes. I don't have to worry about it. it if we look at this, this doesn't reduce. And hopefully, you don't think that x squared cancels x squared, because you cannot cancel terms, only factors. So this is already reduced. There are no vertical asymptotes. If we graph it, we would actually see this on our graph here. It does have a, an intercept, because if this is 0, then the whole thing is 0, because 0 plus 1. 0 over 1 is still 0. So it does have an x-intercept and a y-intercept. But it has no vertical asymptotes to deal with. Now, <clears throat> if we look at this one here, well, let's find the asymptotes or holes if they exist. If I factor the q of x here, I'm going to get x uh, plus 7, x minus 3. So x cannot equal negative 7, or can it equal positive 3? So negative 7 and positive 3. Well, what happens when I factor the top? That's x plus 3, x minus 3. A lot of difference of squares in our examples here. We see the x minus 3's would cancel, which makes this value a whole. Now, if we graph this into our calculator, depending on what kind of calculator you have, you would see that I have a vertical asymptote at x equal to negative 7. But I have a hole, and depending on your calculator, well, let's see, if I put 3 into here, 3 squared, well, that would be, yeah. All right, if, uh, if we put that into our calculator, we'll actually find that this shows it going through that point. It depends on your calculator. You might have a different calculator where you can change the settings so you can see that. But most calculators aren't going to show you that hole. You have to know that that value doesn't exist. Uh, let's see, it'd be 6 tenths, or 3 fifths. So 3 3 fifths would be a hole. So this value right here, this point 3 3 fifths, is a hole in our graph. All right, so let's move on to uh, finding a different class of asymptote. And that is finding a horizontal asymptote. Now, in one of the examples, we've seen the behavior as the graph went left to right. Um, actually, I don't want this board just yet. Let's return to this board right here. We're going to look at something called the horizontal asymptote. We looked at the behavior of this graph as it approached the y-axis, so as x approached 0 from the left, and as x approached 0 from the right, we looked at its limit. What's the behavior of the graph? 
Well, what's the behavior of the graph as x goes to infinity or negative infinity? We can use limits to help us describe that as well. Again, the notation as x approaches negative infinity, we can write it as a limit, LIM. The limit as x approaches negative infinity, what's the behavior of the function? Well, as x goes to negative infinity, this here goes lower and lower and lower. If we think about our function x squared, as this number gets more and more negative, it, u squared negative, it's still positive, so it's above the x-axis. But as this number gets larger, it's just going to get closer and closer to 0. It'll never be 0. Let's say 1 when x is a million, or a negative million, 1 over a negative million squared, well, that's just a really, really, really small number. So it's approaching 0. It's never going to cross that axis, but it's approaching it as this goes to negative infinity. Well, what happens? What's the behavior of the graph as x approaches positive infinity? If we look at that, well, as x goes to positive infinity, the same thing occurs. We're just squaring a number, so it's always going to be positive above the x-axis. And as this number gets larger, 1 over a bigger number is a smaller value. So it's getting closer and closer. Again, it approaches 0. Well, <clears throat> what's happening at y equals to 0? This graph on either side is getting infinitely close, but it's never going to actually reach y equals 0. This is called the horizontal asthmatope, which we'll abbreviate HA. Horizontal asthmatopes basically just say that we have, uh, this is what it approaches in its end behavior as it goes to positive infinity or negative infinity. Just for a moment, let's look at this graph right here. You can see this has a horizontal asthmatope. As it goes to positive infinity, it's approaching some number. As it goes to negative infinity, it approaches some number. But it never crosses it in that particular example. All right, now I'm ready for that board. How do we go about finding horizontal asthmatopes? Well, to find a horizontal asthmatope, let's just realize that this rational function is just a polynomial over a polynomial. The key to these are to look at the greatest degree of these polynomials. So there are two cases when we look at these degrees to find a horizontal asthmatope. Case one is where the degree of p of x and the degree of q of x are the same degree. When n, in this case, equals m, and I'll just write that here, m equals n, or n equals m. Well, here's an example of where that holds true. We have x squared as our leading degree term, a second degree polynomial, being divided by another second degree polynomial. When these powers are the same, the horizontal asthmatope is the ratio of their coefficients. Because we're talking about n behavior of the graph, this stuff makes the graph do things close to its zeros. But as we get further out, as x goes to infinity, this term is getting big real fast. It's squared relative to those. These become insignificant. End behavior, it approaches the ratio of their coefficients, 3 halves. So in this case, the horizontal asthmatope is the ratio of their coefficients, the top over the bottom. So in this case, y equals 3 halves. And we recognize that as a constant function, right? It's just a line. Well, that line in either direction, as x goes to infinity, it's going to approach this value, its end behavior. Now case two, the degree of p of x is less than the degree of q of x, which means n, in this case, is less than m. All right, And I'll write that right here. n is less than m. Well, let's look at this example here. We have a function equals x minus 9, a polynomial divided by 2x squared plus x plus 3. If we notice, the degree of the top is 1, and the degree of the bottom is 2, well, n is less than m. Well, this one's really easy. If we think about it, n behavior, as these, goes, as these values go to infinity, it behaves as 1 over x. Well, that tells me 
that x cannot equal 0 in, in this example, that means the behavior of this graph is it's going to approach 0 as it goes to positive infinity or negative infinity. It may cross it at some point, but its end behavior, it's only going to approach these values. So we, simple enough, y equals 0 when the value of the denominator's degree is greater than the value of the numerators. All right, let's move on. Lots of boards here for this section. Oh, I forgot one example I wanted to do here. All right, let's look at these examples. Let's find the horizontal asthmatope of these examples right here. If we look at this, we have the polynomial negative 8x cubed plus x squared plus 1 over 9x cubed plus x plus 2. Well, which, which scenario, case 1 or case 2, am I going to look at here? Well, I notice their powers are the same. And if we recall, if they have the same degree, it is the ratio of their coefficients. So I have negative 8 over 9. So y equals negative 8 ninths. This is my horizontal asthmatope, because it fits our scenario. Well, if we look at this one here, we could find those vertical asthmatopes, but right now we're concentrating on horizontal asthmatopes. The degree of the num or numerator is less than the degree of the denominator. So we see this is a case 2 scenario, where n is less than m, the top is less than the bottom's degree. Our horizontal asthmatope is y equals 0. That means as this goes to infinity, it's going to approach y equals 0. Lastly, let's look at this one. Well, the degree of the top is greater than the degree of the bottom. Well, what does that mean? Well, it doesn't fit either case. Well, this means it's a different type of asthmatope. It's something called the oblique asthmatope. So now we can move on to that board. The oblique asthmatope. It says the degree of p of x is greater than the degree of q of x. To find an oblique asthmatope, we essentially have to do division. Now, you can do long division, or you can do synthetic division if it's a candidate for synthetic division. Hopefully, uh, you remember how to do that. If not, go back and review. It is in your textbooks. Um, <clears throat> to find the oblique asthmatope, in this chapter or at this level of algebra, we're generally going to look at what are called linear oblique asthmatopes, where p of x is only one greater than the degree of q of x. And that's the case here. So I'm going to do this division, and I'm going to use synthetic division, because that's how we find oblique asthmatopes. We just actually do this division. Now, if I do synthetic division, it's the opposite of this. It's 0, essentially, which is going to be negative 5. And then I just use the coefficients here in descending order. Negative 1, well, there is no x term, so I'm going to call it 0, and then my constant of 1. Now, synthetic division, if we recall, we just bring down negative 1, and then we multiply. Negative 5 times negative 1 is a positive 5. 0 and 5 is 5. Negative 5 times 5 is negative 25. This is a remainder. We're not worried about remainders, because when we talk about end behavior, the remainders are insignificant, because we're talking about x is getting very large. Well, if we think about this, this is a linear equation right here. We're not going to worry about any uh, remainders. We have y equals negative x plus 5. This is the, uh, a linear equation that our graph approaches as x goes to infinity. Let's just kind of throw this on a graph real quick here. If this is my oblique asthmatope, uh, negative x plus 5, that means it's got a decreasing slope that intercepts at y equals 5. And how we put oblique asthmatopes or horizontal asthmatopes, vertical asthmatopes, is we use a dashed line. So here is my dashed line that represents this. My graph, as it goes to end behavior is going to approach this line. Well, I know that x cannot equal negative 5, so let's put in our vertical asthmatope. So here are my asthmatopes. What's the behavior of the graph? Well, 
to find what's going on here, we can just plot a few points. Let's, uh, let's choose something in between our asthmatopes. Let's say 0. Well, if I put 0 into here, I get 1 fifth. So 1 fifth is uh, right about here. And let's choose another value so I can kind of see its behavior. What's happening as we get close to this asthmatope? Let's choose negative 4. Negative 4 squared is 16, so a negative 16 plus 1 is negative 15. And negative 4 plus 5 is a positive 1. Negative 15 over 1 is negative 15. It's some value way down here. So if it's not going to cross these asthmatopes, what I can do is I can say, oh, well, it's going to do something like that. As this arrow goes to infinity, it's only going to approach this line. And as it goes to infinity, it's only going to approach this line. There's another piece to this function. If I were to continue this up, we would see that it's also going to look something like that. So a complicated graph, but using its vertical asthmatopes and knowing its end behavior, we can actually graph them no matter how complicated they are. But for this example, we just wanted you to really find the oblique asthmatope. So let's do a little bit of summary, and then I'll give you a little quiz. Here's our summary. If we have a rational uh, function, f of x equals p of x over q of x, we think of this as a polynomial over a polynomial. The vertical asthmatopes are the zeros of q of x. If we reduce it and some of those reduced factors go away, those become our holes. So we put an open circle for that value on the graph. Horizontal asthmatopes, well, there's two cases where the degree, n and m, are the same value. It is the ratio of their coefficients. As it goes to infinity, one direction or another, it approaches that value. Uh, if n is less than m, the x-axis, y equals 0, our 0 function, is the asthmatope. It will approach 0 as x goes to positive or negative infinity. And then we have the last case was the oblique asthmatope when n is greater than m. The degree of the top is greater than the degree of the bottom. We can use division. We have to divide. So whether you use synthetic division if it's a candidate or if you lose, use long division of polynomials, which can get kind of ugly at times, you can actually find these asthmatopes and use them to graph a function. So here's your quiz just to refresh your memory on how to divide polynomials. Now we left this one when we were talking about horizontal asthmatopes. This is your quiz right here. Find the oblique asthmatope of this right here. And I'll tell you right now, this is not a candidate for synthetic division. All right, so try that on your own. Find that oblique asthmatope. It should be the equation of a line. And this has been section 5.2. Thank you for watching.